Okay, so now um, the knight has fulfilled this purpose, right? Uh, helping with the advance to C5, and now. Return uh, to support the center. All right. G5. And now Rook B1. All right. G4 is played. Now let's take let's take some time. Um, let's take some time to mention that. Um, interesting um stuff in the notes and i want to i want to share with you uh you know i just quote he, he says that many people in the press center were expecting or is to uh play the move bishop to a3 right that's one that's one idea and the other idea is basically knight d2 to c4 Attacking uh, d6, of course, it, you know, stops this move right here. Um, then he goes on and say, it is important to note that my knight on d2 is a key defender of my king side. If black recap, if he captured with this knight. Meanwhile, when black plays his pawn to g4, he will have various tactical ideas based on knights sacrificing themselves on h3 or f3. He says, my knight on d2 helps diffuse these ideas. Rook b1 prepares the maneuvers. Queen d1 to b3 to b6. So, he wants to play this and that. Or, knight d2, c4, b6. <clears throat> While tying the bishop on c8, right? So rook b1 ties the bishop to the defense of the b7 pawn. Then he goes on to say, while g3 looks tempting as black as the black knight is forced to g6, in the long term, black would be able to utilize the weakening of my f3 square by playing f takes e4, knight e7, f5, d4, followed by knight g6, e7, and f5. So moving on now, 18 g4 was played, queen b3, f takes e4. Uh, this is black's only chance for counterplay. The downside, again, this is always like this in these king's Indian uh, structures. Sometimes you have to make the decision whether you're going to open the f file or you try to continue pushing on with uh, f4. Of course, in this case, the knight is already on f4. The downside of this exchange is that white gets control of the e4 square. All right. On the upside for black is that he can play this idea knight f5 to d4. <clears throat> All right, so moving the king from the dangerous or potentially dangerous diagonal bishop b3 knight f5 bishop b6 queen e7 queen b4 and of course, this keeps black tied up to the defense of the d6 pawn. Um, this makes it very difficult for him to regroup his pieces for defense or attack. All right, so that's um, a very important thing to understand, especially in the opposite wings attacks, is that uh, sometimes you have to take time to slow your opponent's attack down if it's far advanced, or uh, if your opponent's attack has potential of getting very serious to create threats in other areas of the board. So right here, white has a nice advantage here. He has a lot of space on the queen side and he has pressure directly applied uh, to the d6 pawn. Whereas, it's not really certain how black's attack is going to press through. White has great control of the e4 square. And um, again, Karpov's strategy of weathering the storm and leaving black saddle with positional weakness uh seems to be very effective here against <clears throat> against Komsky. a4 bishop f8 and um 
right here what black wants to do is play um, bishop d7 and then e8 bishop e3 so again understand understanding that Kafar simply moves his bishop and it's hard to now it's hard for Kamsky to move this bishop right here because of the threat to this pawn Knight h5. So some of you guys want to play knight takes e3. Uh, the problem with knight is, um, e3, besides giving up some time here, is if the f takes e3, then uh, white is going to follow up with the move knight b5. And, you know, just putting more pressure on this pawn right here. So let's say after uh, knight g6. And then white is just uh, too darn active. Okay, black has black's uh, attack is is stalled on the king side, and uh, white is just too active here. So knight h5, <clears throat> rook bc1, and we already know what black is planning here. Excuse me, what white is planning? He wants to invade on c7. He wants to put this rook here. So that means we need a bishop here. You know, to serve as a de facto outpost and then put the rook here knight f6 there it is bishop b6 h5 trade some pieces off knight e4 so again this is uh just positional lessons given by karpov right now queen g6 a5 is played <coughs> excuse me Knight g7. And what this does is pre free up the f5 square for the bishop. Okay, so so Kansky can play that. And also, by freeing up this bishop, you free up this rook. Okay, so it's multi-purpose move. Another idea, can you spot it? Behind knight g7 is to be able to play knight e8 if need be to protect the d-pawn. So you can see that one move has, uh, again, more than one purpose. And that's what I'm. That's a mark of strength in the chess player's game when you find these moves that, you know, your moves accomplish, you know, uh, two and three objectives. Bishop b5. And now the idea, again, is rook c7. Because it's really hard for white, uh, excuse me, black to defend the d6 pawn. Again, I'll just, let's imagine if white can move again. Well, obviously in this position, you could just play bishop c7 here. But just to give you the spirit of the idea, rook c7, rook takes c7, and then bishop takes c7. And knight f5 to defend. Knight f5 to defend d6. Sorry about that, it was a slip. <laughs> and bishop d3 with, <clears throat> excuse me, with this x-ray attack through here is very strong. Again, white is, uh, is winning. Back to the position here. So bishop f5 is placed. Uh, of course, Kansky has to continue along with his plan. Knight g3. Bishop goes back. Rook c3. And this is a bad sign. You know how it is. If you, Especially if you're a King's Indian player. You know what it's like when you're in trouble. And this is one of those positions. There's no no meaningful play on the uh, king side of the board. Meanwhile, white is just uh, flooding the uh, queen side and have no type of pressure on um, the black uh, position. Okay, now, <clears throat> h4, bishop d3, and now Gada makes a mistake here, and knight f5. This is a real simple tactical mistake and had to occur in time pressure. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind because any 
any class A player, even class B player could see the move um rook takes c8 here just just removing the defender off of this knight and so rook takes followed by knight takes f5 it's just absolutely in the driver's seat there so after knight f5 karpov played knight takes f5 which is not the strongest move again rook this rook takes c8 Bishop takes f5, queen takes f5, and now he just simply played rook c4. Now he's he's still better, but he just chose like a, a more simple solution. And of, of course, he admits that he made a mistake too. He, uh, Karl Paul said that he was in time trouble also. And he missed the immediate win with just rook takes c8, which is incredible to me because, I mean, I saw it immediately like years ago when I first looked at the game. But, you know, who am I to judge? But just make an observation. Queen takes f5. Rook c4. Okay. And now this this uh doesn't allow black any counterplay. For instance, at the rook e4. Right? Say if he does rook e4 instead. And black has this powerful shot here. Uh... And rook takes a5. Now you can all see that if queen takes a5, then the uh, then the rook drops. But here's the the other move that's very strong. Now if bishop takes a5, it takes the bishop away from the defense of f2. And if queen takes f2, king h1, and queen f1 mate. So a very strong, um, very strong move by the uh, by. Uh, Kansky available. That's if uh, Rook e4 was played by Karpov. And now Karpov doesn't mention um, this possibility. He he mentions Rook e4 and just Rook c8 as po a potential counterplay for Black. But White is still winning at the Rook takes c8, Queen takes c8, and then just simply Rook c4, forcing the Queen back off the. Um, Diagonal off the uh, C file and then Rook takes G4, but what Karpov did not mention or missed rather was this tactical shot Rook takes A5, and um, again, not to beat a dead horse, but that's one thing that um, I noticed in, in Karpov's career. Great, of course, great, fantastic player, one of the all-time greats. But I noticed that when he plays against or played against these real sharp uh, tacticians. Um, especially in his his older years, that um, sometimes he would be susceptible to blows, the tactical blows of that exact nature. Where in a position, you look at the board, you know white is better, right? <clears throat> white is better, but instead of set it, settling down and making that concrete move, Karpov will often make the um, Karpov will often make the move like Rook takes a five. Okay, so as I was saying, so Karpov sometime in his career was susceptible to blows like this where he will be better and, and have an advantage and then will make like one lazy move. Like for instance, in this position, Rook E4 and then somebody like Kasparov will find a shot like this and then go on and defeat him. He lost a lot of games like that. One, one, um, one move like tactical shots but here he doesn't make that mistake although he overlooked it in an analysis which makes me feel that if he he saw it, uh, another reason not to play it which was not really correct either because the reason why he was saying was just off based on rook c8 but anyway going back rook c rook c4 was played just um attacking g4 rook g7 Queen b1 and queen h5. Now, Karpov says that Gato almost played queen f7 here, but then he says that it loses to queen d1, queen f5, rook e to e4, rook c8, rook takes queen takes 
then he gives h3, g takes, and now rook takes h4, king g8, followed by g g3. So here, Kamsky played, I'm sorry, um, Karpov played queen d1. And queen d1 threatens to move h3 since the queen on h5 is not protected. H3, rook e, e4, h takes g2, rook takes g4 now, rook h7, and this forces the h pawn to have to move. So this exposes the king side a little bit. So now, again, Karpov reaches the time control here, and so... Basically, he he missed a he missed a win as we mentioned on move 35 by playing knight takes f5, rook takes c8 just wins. So now he's in this ending with a, an adjournment, and so now he has to figure out you know how to you know basically convert this advantage which wasn't as large as it seemed uh, before because he was actually winning. Bishop e7, f3. Rook g8, bishop f2, rook hg7. And now Karpov again misses the most critical continuation. He plays queen e2. Why not just take? Let's swap these babies off. Rook takes g7, rook takes g7, rook g4. These are natural looking moves to me. Bishop d8, okay. And now Karpov gives queen a4. Here, and that's good enough. That just preserves the advantage. Even stronger might be queen c1. Or just rook takes g7 here also, then queen a4. Trade off another pair of rooks. Right, simplify the position. You know, you're winning. Anyway, queen e2 was chosen. Bishop d8. Bishop e1, again, white should trade the rooks. Queen f7, queen d3, and now queen h5 from Gata. Now, he was short of time again, and this this is, was a killer for uh, Kamsky. Um, here, he had some drawing chances here. He could have played b5 here. That gives an opportunity. Karpov says rook takes g4. Rook takes g4. Then he he says rook f8. And he gives king g2 followed by bishop takes a5. Which is uh, absolutely ridiculous. Because it over, it's, an over, uh, blah, it's an oversight in his analysis. This is based on this is based on rook takes g4, f takes g4. And now you can get away now you can get away with the move um, rook f8 king g2 and now you can get away with bishop takes a5 because of the weakness on f2. And that's the, that leads to a perpetual but now instead of h if instead of f takes g4 if rook takes g4 i'm sorry now here's the correct line if rook takes g4 rook takes g4 f takes g4 e4 this gives better chances for black than in the game because of course the queen can't be distracted off of the uh, guardianship of the f1 square because of that. <clears throat> okay, so gotta play queen h5, queen e4, queen h6, queen f5. 
Bishop takes F. Blah. Bishop takes A5. And the idea is based on the weakness of the back rank here. If Bishop takes A5, then just simply Queen E3. King takes G2, Queen E2, and that's going to lead to a perpetual check. So here, Karpov, instead of capturing the bishop, play bishop, uh, rook takes G7. And he's also on time pressure. And G2. Queen takes G7. Uh, gotta miss a critical continuation here. Rook takes G7. And then... White still has a, a edge here after King H3, but after Queen takes G7, and it's a shame because it, the move looks so natural. There's the double of pieces, right? But um, the problem is, is after Rook G4, put down what you know, it just refused the whole idea. Queen E7. Now Queen H5 is just winning. Queen H6 had to be played just to keep the just to keep the queen off h5, although um, white is still winning easily here. But at the queen e7 now, queen h5, queen um, queen h5 check, queen h7, rook g8, king g8, and Karpov just finds a, a simple uh, solution here. And stash is a pawn. And now both players reach the time control. And now they reach the uh they reach the adjournment. Okay, so now you have uh gotta seal this move. Where I mean well he basically he, he's lost in this position, but you have to be careful as white, you know, not to fall into a perpetual uh check situation. All right. And also you have to examine the bishop, the possible bishop endings after the the queens are traded off. So this is like the major uh, crux of the problem. So even though white is up a pawn, there might be scenarios where, say, if the queens are gone, a bishop could sacrifice itself for a pawn or something uh, at the end. And also uh, white has to worry about black getting um, perpetual checks. All right, so after the adjournment analysis, um, by the way, let me just, uh, yeah, I, actually, I'll save that for the next video. After the adjournment analysis, the, the basic plan that they came up with, this is uh, Karpov's team, is that he sh that White should just uh, threaten, um, threaten to advance the D-pawn, right, which is obvious because this pawn is passed, so threaten to queen that. And maintain control over the B pawn, which is Black's only real source of counterplay to get this down the board. And that was bit the basic uh, plans in this position. So first, Bishop G3. And attacking right here. Bishop C7. Queen E6. King H7. And there's the events. D6. Queen h5 check, queen f5, king h3, queen f6, queen takes f6, and now here's the bishop end, end, ending that I mentioned, and white is good because this h pawn is on the same color as the bishop, the square is on the same color, so there's no uh, stalemate opportunities with the uh, wrong color bishop ending. Now, like I said in the previous videos, having an adjournment, um, uh, in this match really helped Karpov a lot because he had, he had time to rest. He had his team and along with Komsky and they could go over these, these complicated endings so he didn't have to use as much energy in the match. There's the B pawn, black source of counterplay as we mentioned. King takes E5. G6, King G6, King D5. B4, King C5. So... There it is. Now stopping Black's only source of counterplay. King b3. King f5. King f4. King e6. And now h5. And uh, uh, Kamsky uh, resigned. So 
Um, Kamsky wins. Um, excuse me, Kamsky loses quite quickly after H5. All right, so like for example, let's just enter. <clears throat> so after H5, it's King F5, H6, King G6. Give it to the bishop. B3, and then just simply Bishop E5, stopping this pawn in his tracks. All right, so after seven games. Karpov has won four out of seven, and Kamsky has won one game. So Karpov led five and a half to two and a half after seven games. So I hope you're enjoying the series so far. Um, if you want, you can always start, look for the playlist, and you'll see all the games in a chronological order. All right, I'll see you on the next video.